everyone, and welcome to the lineup. Today is April 18th, 2024. I'm Barry Stagner, and before we jump in, I just wanted to say thanks for those uh, who were praying uh, for the travels that uh, we had these past couple of weeks. I was in uh, Lima, Ohio uh, a week ago, uh, two weeks ago now, I guess, and uh, had a wonderful all-day conference in Lima, Ohio at Calvary Chapel, Lima, and Pastor Mike. And then uh, that evening, I drove down to, or was driven actually down to Portsmouth, Ohio, a town established in 1803, and had a great time there uh, with Pastor Joe and the wonderful folks at Calvary Chapel Portsmouth at their Sunday morning services. And then last weekend, uh, Terry and I uh, were blessed to drive out to the church that my sister attends as they were holding an all-day conference in Prescott, Arizona. And uh, we just had a great time. Uh, Pastor Michael Lay was there. Great to see uh, he and Jason from Behold Israel. Uh, David Guzik was there. And uh, another gentleman I had a chance to meet for the first time. Uh, very, very blessed to hear his teaching. Uh, Gary Kaw, uh, who is kind of an expert on uh, globalism and things of that nature that are developing and how things like the uh, Illuminati and Masonry and all that have uh, contributed to that and are kind of uh, remaining an influence in that direction that the world is headed. So we just had a great time. And uh, thank you uh, for uh, all the prayers and those had a chance to meet and shake hands with uh, who watched the lineup in both of those places. We just uh, had a great time and uh, now looking forward to being home for a, a little bit. <clears throat> and then at the end of May, uh, heading over to Israel to spend some time there and with Amir and uh, do some things that connect. So excited about that. And then after that, uh, home until the fall. And I've got some awesome things coming up in the fall. I'll let you know uh, what they are when that time draws near. But uh, again, what a what a weekend it was in Israel. And we were actually at the conference when things started to break about the drone and missile and rocket attack that came uh, from all directions, but predominantly the surprise component of Iran actually launching from their own territory, uh, this barrage of drones uh, toward the nation of Israel. And once again, uh, God showed himself strong on behalf of his chosen people as uh, 99% of these uh, never even reached Israeli territory. And they were all shot down by, uh, you know, either uh, uh, hardware from uh, the IDF or the IAF, I should say, the Israeli Air Force, or the U.S., Jordanian, and um, I believe the French uh, Air Force was also involved, or at least there was some uh, uh, some type of hardware that was employed that uh, caused the, uh, the missiles to fall on uh, harmless areas and not reach their uh, determined point. So, again, just a, an incredible act of God, I would say. And, you know, God uses people and devices and all those things. And uh, he also, as the Palestinians used to say in previous attacks, it's like their God is turning our missiles. Yeah, he can do that too. Uh, he is still on the throne. He is still uh, neither sleeping nor slumbering. He who watches over Israel has his eye on them as they've been brought back into the land uh, to uh, do what God has ordained for them to do and to uh, experience, sadly, the tribulation period where he finalizes his discipline on rebellious Israel, which leads to them looking upon the one whom they pierced and mourning as one mourns for an only son. So uh, just amazing times that we live in. And let's jump into some stories here. And I started with this one because it, it's kind of a, a double-edged sword in, in a sense that um, you know, the the influence that so many have today because they have deep pockets is a bit shameful and embarrassing. And uh, that especially points to the United States of America as uh, we are pressuring Israel to do things that uh, they as a people group have already decided to do and their cabinet has approved it. And the Jewish News Syndicate says that Israel has shelved the Iran strike plans due to U.S. pressure. Now, you know this pressure is we're not going to give you any more money. We're not going to support you financially or militarily. And, you know, again, this administration is just a mess. What a shameful group of people uh, who are at the top and, and in our country and and handling the joysticks, joysticks, so to speak, as to where our country is headed. 
and the U.S. has agreed to back an Israeli operation in Gaza's southernmost city of Rafah in exchange for foregoing a major strike on Iran, according to Israeli media. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and actually one of the first articles that I was looking at uh, for this evening was that Netanyahu said, nobody's going to tell us what to do. Well, money talks, I guess. And Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu backtracked on a pre-approved military response to Iran's massive drone and missile attack due to pressure by U.S. President Joe Biden, Israel's Khan public uh, broadcaster reported on Wednesday. Biden reportedly told Netanyahu during a phone call on Saturday that Washington would not participate nor support an Israeli retaliatory attack. According to the report, Netanyahu thereafter shelved a series of options that had already been approved by the cabinet. The response won't be what was planned. Diplomatic sensitivities won out, the reporter quoted a senior Israeli sources saying. Nevertheless, the source stressed that there would be some form of action against Iranian interests. And other articles have stated this will be uh, in the form of sanctions. And we know how massively effective those have been, especially, you know, as we've watched this continued enrichment of uranium and, uh, you know, wep- uh, near weapons grade enrichment levels. And, you know, all these sanctions have done absolutely nothing. And the U.S. official told ABC News on Wednesday that the Israeli response could now come after the Passover holiday, which begins Monday evening and ends April 30th. The ABC report cited Israeli officials as saying that Jerusalem on two occasions this week dropped imminent plans to strike Iran. Overnight Saturday, Iran launched more than 300 missiles and drones at Israel, and the IDF said it uh, and its military allies intercepted some 99% of the projectiles, as we mentioned a moment ago. And Netanyahu said, I want to thank our friends for supporting Israel's defense, uh, support in both words and in deeds, Netanyahu said, ahead of a cabinet meeting in Jerusalem. They also have all kinds of suggestions and advice, and I appreciate those, but I want to make it clear. We will make our own decisions, and the state of Israel will do everything necessary to defend itself, he added. And Netanyahu addressed the government minister shortly after meeting with British Foreign Secretary David Cameron and German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock at the Prime Minister's office in Jerusalem. And Western governments have called on Israel to refrain from retaliating against Tehran, fearing the expansion of a regional war. You know, I mean, if we put this just on a a, a ground roots level, think about not responding to a bully. What happens? Well, they keep bullying. And if you never stand up, then you're just going to keep getting bullied. And these things are going to continue. And, you know, to a degree, and we even said this at the Prophecy Conference on last Saturday, when all this was going down and the drones were in the air, that, you know, one, to take six hours to fly all the way from Iran to its uh, determined targets in Israel was like shooting fish in a barrel. And this was just almost a safe face effort on the part of uh, Ayatollah Khamenei at, uh, because of you know all of his bloviating regarding what happened with the diplomatic facility in Syria, the death of five high, very high-ranking IRGC uh, members, generals, that is. And, you know, he just had to do something. So, you know, this was just a, almost a silly thing to do and a waste of money, uh, obviously. But it also cost Israel a lot of money to put those jets in the air and to fire missiles and rockets uh, to, you know, basically defeat this and use the aero system and all the other things we know that took place that day. But again, you know, the the pressure from the U.S. administration not to respond, uh, it's just unimaginable. And to make threats, you know there were threats about withholding funds. Some of them have already uh, been made public as calls among the Democratic Party, you know, to defund Israel and all these other things continue to this very day. And those uh, who are uh, part of a a group called the Squad, who have no business being in any office within the United States government. Uh, They are anti-American and and refuse to condemn uh, the things that uh, Hamas has done and all these other heinous things. But what what a shameful place our world has arrived in, and our country too. In, uh, in being the bully, so to speak, uh, through, you know, pressures, uh, financial pressures of withholding funds so the people of God could defend themselves in their nation that God gave them. 
Now, Al Jazeera reports Iran's Raisi reiterates warnings as Israel mulls response to their air attack. Raisi said the tiniest attack by Israel would bring a massive and harsh response, Iran's president has reiterated, as a concern over the threat of full-scale war in the Middle East persists. President Ibrahim Raisi's warning came on Wednesday as he spoke at Iran's annual army parade, and the world is braced for potential retaliation to Iran's attack on Israel, which took place over the weekend. Israel has pledged to respond despite calls for it to hold back persisting on all sides, and the UK's foreign minister suggested Wednesday as he visited Israel that it has decided to act. And speaking at the ceremony, Raisi hailed Iran's direct attack on Israel, dubbed True Promise, and reiterated recent threats of a strong and fierce response. Now, obviously, our first article came in uh, after this one, but I think we need to remember that, you know, the intentions of the Iranian uh, administration or regime, I should say, is the destruction of the nation of Israel. And nothing has changed that. As a matter of fact, if there is going to be any result of the pressures from the Biden administration, it's going to be an emboldening uh, of this wicked regime who seeks the destruction of the great Satan, the United States of America, as well as the small or little Satan, and that being the nation of Israel. And since Operation Al-Aqsa Flood, an attack on Israel by the Palestinian group Hamas in October, set off a war in Gaza, Iranian allies in Lebanon and Yemen have been engaged in low-level hostilities with Israel. However, a suspected Israeli strike on Iran's consulate in Syria on April 1st prompted Iran's first ever direct attack against Israel. The people of the world saw that after Operation Al-Aqsa Flood, True Promise collapsed the Zionist regime's uh, false uh, uh, hegemony, uh, Raisi asserted. Calling that attack limited, he claimed that if Iran had wanted to carry out a bigger attack, nothing would remain from the Zionist regime. Uh, I think Raisi and Ayatollah Khamenei uh, forget that Israel is a nuclear power, one of the uh, strongest militaries in the world, and you know, just all of this talk and saber rattling and and these uh, threats that just continue to pour out of there. There's an element of truth behind them because that certainly is what they wish uh, to do. And, you know, they've been, uh, as we talked about a moment ago, they've been enriching uranium. You know, 20 percent enrichment of the dividing of the the, the isotopes within the uh, uranium which is uh, 235 and 238 and creating fissile material from the 235 that can be turned into a bomb. You know, this is a costly and and just ongoing process, a, a very laborious process as uh, these two components are separated. And, you know, once you reach 20%, you've reached energy grade and there's no point in going any further because you have to go all the way to 90% in order to achieve weapons grade. And there's really no usage for 60%, 70% enriched uranium. It's pointless to spend all the money to enrich beyond 20% if you're going to use it for energy, as Iran has continually reported. And it's far short of 90% uh, to stop at those levels. So we know they have uh, enrichment levels up beyond 60%. I mean, those are old numbers. Those are like a year old numbers as far as percentage goes. I haven't heard anything new or I would uh, report on that. But the truth of the matter is their desire is to create uh, purchase, uh, somehow launch some type of nuclear device on Israel. And we'll talk about that uh, also in a few moments. As um, our next article says that uh, the sun excuse me, reports that Iran vows to strike with a weapon never used before as Israel pledges they won't get off scot-free after the missile blitz. Iran has vowed to unleash a weapon never used before against Israel if the country retaliates for Tehran's missile and drone blitz. Israel told Iran they won't get off scot-free for the attacks as the world waits with bated breath for their response amid fears of an uncontrollable war across the Middle East. It comes as the U.S. now believes Israel is planning a narrow and limited strike inside Iran. But Iranian Chief Secretary, or Sec- Security Chief, I'm sorry, uh, Abu Fazl Amoni, uh, last night warned that if Israel does respond, 
then Tehran is prepared to use a weapon that we have never used. It's unclear what weapon Amone uh, was referring to, but he warned Israel to act wisely as it considers the next steps. A chief IDF spokesman responded to the threats, vowing that Iran will face retaliation. An IDF spokesman, Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari, said we cannot stand still from this kind of aggression. Iran will not get off scot-free with this, and we will respond in our time and our place in the way that we will choose. And a senior administration official and another source familiar with the intelligence told CNN they understood Israel was considering an attack inside Iran with a limited strike. And the official told the U.S. broadcaster, we would hope that they would give us some warning so that we're prepared to protect our personnel, not just military, but diplomatic throughout the region. And further uh, significant escalation is pretty much the opinion across the board will only deepen instability in the region. Now, the question that often comes up is, could this lead to the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war? Could the destruction of Damascus, as Isaiah 17, 1 prophesies, be the end result of all the things that we've seen now churning in the Middle East? And the answers are yes and yes, absolutely. Something is going to ignite the fuse of the powder keg known as the Middle East. And there could very well be soon a hook in the jaw put in the um, of the jaw of these invading nations, as Ezekiel says. And God will draw these nations down from their place in the far north, and uh, they will invade Israel and meet their demise quite handily as the Lord responds, as Ezekiel 39 says, with uh, an earthquake, flooding rain, and a hail mingled with blood and all these other uh, wrath of God type, type of uh, responses, uh, similar to that um, which we see prophesied of in Zechariah chapter 12 through 14, Zechariah chapter 12 through 14, pointing back to uh, the Egyptian exodus as well, as uh, Zechariah says that the Lord will fight as he fights in the day of battle. And the Exodus story tells us exactly the weaponry that God has. I, I've always, and I've mentioned this before, I think it's a good thing for us to read through uh, Job chapters 38 and 39, because the Lord is questioning Job as, uh, you know, Job went through some stuff. Uh, I'm sure we'd all agree with that quickly. And uh, all these horrid things happening, happened to him in one day. And yet he did not accuse God of wrong, Job chapter 1 tells us. But, you know, the conversations with his three friends, such as they are, uh, you know, led to some comments by Job. And then the Lord stood Job up and said, hey, you know, where were you when I set the boundaries of the sea and all these other comments? And it's just I think it's just a healthy reminder uh, of exactly who's who in this God humanity relationship. But one of the things I think is worth mentioning is the Lord asked Job, have you seen the treasury of hail that I have reserved for the time of the end? And again, this is how God fights. God fights with supernatural uh, things. I mean, if the Iranians want to say, you know, we're going to use a weapon never before used, well, God has some never before seen, at least not by the modern age. And, you know, what God has at his disposal is far greater than any uh, puny nuclear device. And I say that intentionally because the way God fights and the way uh, the access and the arsenal that he has access to is a lot different. He fights with meteors and comets and, and hailstones, you know, and we're told in the book of Revelation that there's uh, hailstones at the end, the final of the bold judgments that is an exceedingly great plague. We're told that each of the hailstones weighed about a talent. Now, talent, obviously, uh, a unit of measure that uh, has a metal metallurgical association. A talent of silver is 100 pounds. A talent of gold is 200. And I'm thinking because God is the one who is uh, using and dispatching these hailstones that uh, probably the latter of the two is the weight and unit of measure we should use. God is going to bombard the earth with 200-pound hailstones. And, and people, of course, will do what they've done throughout the tribulation period, and that is curse God. So God is fighting for Israel and will fight for Israel. And man's weapons have been effective thus far, and we're grateful for all that we've seen on this uh, attack on Israel. But it's also, as I mentioned at the outset, it's kind of a sad day that decisions are made based on money. 
and whether or not you can protect or respond to an attack on your own country. And that the fact that a country like, like ours would threaten to withhold resources for another nation, the only democracy in the Middle East, the chosen people of God's national homeland, and would use money to influence their decisions and uh, hinder them from furthering uh, uh, further furthering the, uh, another assault of, of that kind from the Iranians, say nothing of Hamas. The Al Jamaina reports that Hamas leader Haniye is set to meet Turkish President Erdogan. And Ismail Haniye, the political leader of the Palestinian Islamic Terror Group, Hamas is scheduled to visit Turkey for talks with Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan. According to reports from the broadcaster NTV, Erdogan had earlier confirmed the upcoming meeting while addressing lawmakers from his AK party in parliament, reaffirming Turkey's stance on Hamas as a liberation movement. And the meeting comes in the wake of a phone call last Wednesday, during which Erdogan uh, offered condolences to Haniye after three of his sons were reportedly killed in an Israeli airstrike in Gaza. Israel will definitely be held accountable before the law for the crimes against humanity it committed, Erdogan told Haniye, according to the uh, Associated French Press. And confirming the fatalities, the IDF forces stated that the three operatives killed in the strike were indeed the sons of Haniye, the chairman of Hamas, Hamas Political Bureau. Now, we reported a couple of weeks back that he rejoiced in the fact uh, that his sons experienced martyrdom and therefore had the guarantee of uh, life in um, paradise, as the Muslims believe. Now, Erdogan's support for Hamas has been evident amid renewed tensions between Turkey and Israel, although the two countries announced normalization of relations in August 2022. Erdogan has resumed his verbal attacks on Israel since the onset of the war in Gaza. Now, we have to remember, you know, the Bible talks about the book of Revelation opens with uh, an escalation of events as we near the appearing of the Lord in the air to meet the church, and then seven years later, or ish, seven years later, plus whatever the gap between the tribulation and the rapture is, uh, the second coming of Christ, and things are going to happen in a birth pang like progression. Obviously, the pick of speed at the end, Revelation opens with the fact that these things are going to happen shortly, and that word shortly means to be in quick succession, or to, once they start, they'll happen rapidly. And, you know, this this change in the uh, relationship between Israel and Turkey ha has happened rapidly in the grand scheme of things because Israel or Turkey used to be a place where Israelis would vacation uh, by the tens of thousands. They would go there and enjoy the beaches uh, and the the boardwalk there. I've walked the boardwalk um, in in Turkey, you know, along the the, the vacation spots that are that are uh, peppered along this very very wonderful and lengthy boardwalk. And uh, I can uh, even now picture the they they would set up you know like upside down fifty gallon drums and poke holes in the top and start a fire underneath and roast chestnuts uh, all up and down the boardwalk. You get hot chestnuts and hey, just a very very wonderful place. Lots of places to eat and all that. But now Erdogan has turned things around, and this nation that was once once Israel friendly and very westernized, the streets are now full of burkas and burkas and hijabs and anti-Israeli rhetoric that flows freely from those in places of power. So the world is changing, and I say that because we need to remember that as all these things develop, these are indications that the Lord's coming for us soon. And that's always something uh, to keep in mind and keep us uh, uh, looking up instead of around at all the things that we see. Now, it doesn't mean we bury our head in the sand and act like nothing's happening, but I think you get the point. Uh, we should not lose hope or joy in the midst of all that we see going on in the world. Now, another Arab paper, Al Arabiya, says Hamas says Iran's attack on Israel was legitimate and deserved. The Palestinian militant group Hamas said Wednesday that Iran's weekend attack on Israel was a legitimate and deserved response to a strike on the Islamic Republic's consulate in Syria. In its first reaction to the Iranian aerial attack, Hamas said it was legitimate and deserved uh, to the uh, response to the Zionist entities targeting of the consulate on April 1st. And the response from the Islamic Republic of Iran confirms at the time when the Zionist entity Israel could act as it wanted without accountability or punishment has now ended, Hamas said in a statement. 
Well, Israel is still under the hand of Almighty God, and he's the one who brought them back into the land. And uh, therefore, you know, all this, again, this this rhetoric and, and nonsense that comes out of uh, like uh, Hamas as well as uh, the Ayatollah and other cohorts uh, to his regime is just nonsense. Uh, the 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 book of Hosea tells us, or Amos, I'm sorry, nine fifteen tells us that when Israel comes back into the land, they will not be uprooted again. So uh, again, we know the outcome of this. So we need to just keep our eyes on the prize, recognizing we are at the time of the end. I believe the end of the church age is upon us, and we are in in the grand scheme of things. And this is just an illustration, obviously. The word picture, I believe we're in the last seconds of the church age, and the Lord could come for us maybe even today. Wouldn't that be awesome? The Jewish News Syndicate indicates that 18 Israelis were wounded in a Hezbollah attack from Lebanon, and 18 people, most of them Israeli soldiers, were injured on Wednesday when a Hezbollah attack targeted a community uh, in the Arab al Aramshe in the Western Galilee, and air raid sirens were not activated in the Bedouin bordered village, and 14 IDF soldiers were among the wounded, the army confirmed on Wednesday evening. And Magan David Adom emergency medics uh, treated the victims on the scene before evacuating them to Galilee Medical Center in Naharia. And one victim arrived in critical condition and required surgery, the hospital said. Two were listed as being in serious condition, while the others had injuries ranging from moderate to minor. And most of the wounded suffered shrapnel injuries, according to the medical center. And Hezbollah said it attacked in response to Israeli airstrikes that killed several of its members in Ain Baal and Chahabia in southern Lebanon earlier this week. And over the past hour, a number of launches were detected from Lebanese territory toward the Arab al Aramshi area, and the IDF attacked the sources of the shooting, the IDF forces confirmed on X. And the Israeli Air Force also attacked terrorist infrastructure in the Lebanese town of Aita Ashab, the military said, noting that several Hezbollah operatives, operatives were staying in the building when it was struck. So, you know, the previous articles mentioned concern about a wider exchange going on. And one of the things I think that's kind of curious uh, about the fact that Israel is going to invade it from the north, be invaded from the north, is that Lebanon seems to be out of the picture in that scenario in the minds of many uh, prophecy interpreters. And uh, the focus seems to be on Syria, which we do know. Uh, there is an Iranian, a Turkish, and a Russian military presence in Syria on the northern border of Israel, but Lebanon's on the northern border too, and Hezbollah is headquartered there. So, you know, we would expect to see an escalation in this particular area as well. And the hook in the jaw can not necessarily be limited to strictly coming from uh, the Syrian side of the northern border of Israel. Uh, Lebanon could very well be a launch point as well, as we do know that Hezbollah would like to see the destruction of Israel, just like Hamas would. Now, the Turkish paper, the Daily Sabah, says the UN uh, Security Council is to hold a vote on full membership of Palestine. There's no such country, but the UN Security Council wants to vote on a full membership for them. And again, just recognizing, as Amir calls them, the united nothing, uh, that's exactly what they are. And, you know, for them to take such a position and, and to seek to, uh, you know, give a, a seat at the table, so to speak, for a country that doesn't even exist is about as anti-Semitic as you can get. And we've all talked about the fact that resolutions come flying out of the U.N. against Israel, where they don't say anything about China or Venezuela or other places where human rights are actually being violated and crimes against humanity are actually being committed, but, you know, against Israel, because that tells us who's running things over at the UN. Who is it that wants to destroy Israel? I mean, who's the spiritual entity that wants to see Israel destroyed? Well, of course, it's Satan. So anytime you see anti-Semitic activities or things that are promoting those who are the enemies of Israel, uh, you know who's behind it. And the UN Security Council is set to hold a vote on Friday, tomorrow, 
on Palestine's full membership in the global body, diplomatic, diplomats said on Wednesday. And the 15-member council is due to vote at 3 p.m. or 1900 hours Greenwich, Greenwich uh, Mean Time. Friday on draft resolution uh, that recommends to the 193-member UN General Assembly that the state of Palestine be admitted to membership of the UN, diplomats said. A council resolution needs at least nine votes in favor and no vetoes by the U.S., Britain, France, Russia, or China to pass. Diplomats say the measure could have the support of up to 13 council members, which would force the U.S. to use its veto. Council member Algeria, which put forward the draft resolution, had requested a vote for Thursday afternoon to coincide with the Security Council meeting on the Middle East, which is expected to be attended by several ministers. And the United States has said that establishing an independent Palestinian state should happen through direct negotiations between the parties and not at the United Nations. We do not see that doing a resolution in the Security Council will necessarily get us to the place where we can find a two-state solution moving forward. U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Linda Thomas-Greenfield, said on Wednesday. But again, this gives us a reminder of Zechariah 12.3 that the whole world is going to be gathered against Jerusalem. And the, you know, in, at least in their minds, the U.N. represents the whole world. And um, you know, most of them are against the nation of Israel and the U.S. Uh, either abstaining or um, vetoing, having veto power, as one of the permanent nations, uh, Security Council nations, and, you know, very possibly bringing this effort to an end. But it is the effort of the majority. It's the belief and the wish and the will of the majority of those in the United Nations. And the U.S. would be the one nation that would, uh, Britain may too, we're not sure where some of these other nations land, but uh, the U.S. has already expressed its desire to see things happen in the normal channels. And, you know, One thing for us to remember is that Zechariah also says that those who would uh, heave Jerusalem away, meaning divide it or do anything contrary to it being the eternal capital of Israel, God will cut them into pieces. And that's exactly what it says, and that's exactly what it means. So I would be very hesitant to participate or be uh, supportive of this dividing of, of the nation of Israel. Now, we do know that in the tribulation period, Zechariah says that the city will be divided in two and horrible things are going to happen as Israel comes under attack, the city of Jerusalem, obviously, but that is not uh, a two-state solution that is in view there. That is a a, a end result of a war effort when uh, Israel is attacked. Now, the Gateway Pundit says a year's worth of rain causes massive flooding in Dubai. And I thought this story was kind of interesting because there was a cloud seeding operation that happened that was carried out for seven days. And the article says unprecedented rainfall struck the heart of the United Arab Emirates on Tuesday, causing extensive flooding throughout Dubai. The intense weather event, which delivered a year's worth of precipitation in just a few hours, resulted in the flood (coughs) of major highways, residential areas, and even the tarmac of Dubai International Airport. Hope that goes away. We're going to be landing there in about five weeks, uh, pushing the bustling city-state to its limits. The torrential downpour also affected neighboring Oman, resulting in 18 deaths, according to the Associated Press. The downpour resulted in over 120 milliliters of 4.75 inches of rain, overwhelming the city's infrastructure, leading to the abandonment of vehicles on flooded roads. The heavy rainfall also caused major disruptions, including at Dubai International Airport, the world's second busiest airport, which was submerged under water. A video circulated online showing large aircraft navigating flooded runways. Citizens are being told to stay inside as thunder, lightning, hail, and heavy rain is slamming the region, and the sudden onslaught of rain has sparked a debate on social media with many users pointing fingers at cloud seeding activities in Dubai. And Robbie Starbuck highlighted the hazards of weather manipulation, stating, I've seen some blaming climate change when the cause is actually the use of weather modification. Cloud seeding where chemicals are sprayed into clouds to create rain caused this. We recently banned this practice in my home state of Tennessee. And anytime you modify the weather, you open yourself up to unintended consequences. I've seen some blaming 
uh, climate change when the cause is actually uh, the use of cloud seeding. And in response to this growing controversy, Grazia Middle East reached out to a meteorology expert from the NCM and uh, who confirmed that the cloud seeding operations had indeed been carried out in the last 24 hours. Other articles stated it had been going on for seven days with six trips executed from Monday to Tuesday afternoon. And the expert explained that these operations are standard whenever suitable clouds are present in the sky. And, you know, when you try and do God's job, man is always going to mess it up. And, you know, this is a desert region and, you know, rain is precious. And obviously uh, less than five inches of rain is considered to be a year's worth or the annual equal to the annual rainfall. And of course they would want it to rain. But, you know, the Lord said in Genesis 8, 22, that seed time and harvest, winter and summer, he's in control of all these things. And they'll continue as long as necessary until there's a new heaven and a new earth, which is implied there. Now, Speaking of Iran, uh, the Jerusalem Post says sexual assault and brutal beatings as Iran renews its violent hijab crackdown. You know, let me just pause for a moment because I think we need to understand how significant this is. You know, women are to be covered uh, with a burqa or the hair is not to be seen in order not to create lust in men. Because obviously women have beautiful hair and long hair. Uh, as a sign of beauty and all these other things. And, you know, just thinking about the ridiculousness of this, where all the pressure is put on women. They have to hide themselves because men will lust after them if they wear provocative clothing. And provocative means not covered head to toe in some places. And Iran has begun intensifying its crackdown on hijab restrictions in several cities in the past week with violent arrests reported across the country by opposition groups and human rights agencies. And again, as we mentioned a moment ago, how many human rights violations against Iran from the UN Security Council uh, last year, uh, that'd be zero. The year before, that'd be zero. And this intensified assault on women across Iran comes after the regime announced the Nur Project. The project aimed at dealing with anomalies has involved a heavy presence of the morality police in several cities since this past weekend. And according to Iran's mayor news agency, police have been instructed to focus on positive behaviors and avoid using negative behaviors as much as possible. And reports from Iran suggest a crackdown has been violent, including sexual harassment, beatings, the use of tasers, widespread arrests, and breaking car windows, among other measures. And the intensification of hijab, that's the covering of the hair, enforcement came just a week after Iranian Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei said that maintaining hijab wearing was of the utmost importance and accused foreigners of hiring women to not wear hijab. One video published on social media showed a woman struggling against the morality police as she was shoved into a van. And Dina uh, Galibaf, a uh, journalist and student at Tehran's Behesti Beheshti uh, University was arrested from her home on Tuesday after posting on X that she had been detained and sexually assaulted by morality police at the metro station in Tehran earlier in the week. And Galibov said the morality police officers violently detained her, tased her while she was trying to access the metro. In a post on Monday, she added that Masa Amini and uh, insulting comments about Masa Amini and women in general. The officers made insulting comments. Sorry, I skipped the line there. On Tuesday, she was taken from her home to an unknown unknown location, and Galibov's ex-account has since been suspended. And the Iranian Teachers Union reported on her arrest as well. And, um, you know, this uh, Iranian journalist, Mashib Alinejad, uh, referenced a renewed crackdown in a post on X to stand against this silent war against Iranian women. And as we mentioned a moment ago, the Islamic regime in Iran has been gradually intensifying enforcement of hijab laws since they were somewhat relaxed in light of a nationwide protest that swept Iran after Masa Amini, a Kurdish Iranian woman, was killed by the, she was 22 years old. She had some of her hair showing uh, by the morality piece in Tehran. Amini's death sparked intense nationwide demonstrations last September, commonly referred to as the Woman Life Liberty 
or Jean Gian Azadi in Kurdish protests, which continued in full strength for months on end. So again, you know, this, this is what this regime is all about. And I've said it frequently, and I'll say it again today, the Iranian people are wonderful people. Our, our next door neighbors are Iranians, and uh, they have, you know, free Iran stickers on their cars. Down the street uh, are other Iranians, uh, two doors down. On the other side of us is an Iranian mom and her uh, young young son. They're wonderful, hardworking, very social and friendly people, and here they are under the control of just this hateful uh, regime and treating women like, well, like Islam says, they're basically their property. And uh, again, what a what an incredible thing to be uh, seeing happen here in the age in which we live. And I think probably one of the other components of this is where's all the voices in, in America that, uh, you know, uh, my body, my choice. Well, where are all these women? Why aren't there protests in this country? Why instead are they protesting against Israel? Why aren't they crying out on behalf of the Iranian women and, and the persecution that they endure by these morality police? And and what they're doing is raping and they're violating Islam in their treatment of these women. And, uh, you know, uh, it's just, it's incredible the age that we live in. And that's why we have to keep focused on the fact that Jesus is coming for us. And uh, we'll be taken out of here. And, you know, I, I say this pretty much at every conference I speak at, as we get accused as pre-tribulation rapturists of wanting to escape the tribulation. Well, yeah, I do. I want to escape the tribulation because what's going to happen during the tribulation is you know, are things like, this world has never seen. Nobody should want to go through it, and nobody should certainly expect biblically for the church to be present uh, during that time. It's a biblical necessity that the church be gone for the whole tribulation, because all of it is God's wrath. God's wrath doesn't start in the second half. We need to get rid of that notion, and it doesn't start with the bold judgments. God's wrath is immediately present when the Antichrist rises to power in uh, Revelation 6, verse 2, which is the opening of the very first seal of the seven. And these are, you know, the components of the tribulation period. So, you know, the Lord could very well come for us at any moment, and we need to keep that in mind. And as Paul told the church at Thessaloniki, comfort one another with these words. Now, LifeSite News underscores one of the reasons I believe that God is going to bring all this uh, that we're experiencing in the world to an end because LifeSite News reports Planned Parenthood committed a record number of 392,715 abortions last year. 2023, just this single entity slaughtered 392,715 babies in the womb. And Planned Parenthood, aided by the Biden administration, committed around 40% of all the U.S. abortions. That's less than half, which tells us, you know, you're pushing 800, 900, 850, 900,000 abortions um, in the U.S. last year. 40% of all abortions in the most recent reporting period, while it's non-abortion services, continued to decline. And they like to say, we're all about women's health, but... Uh, killing babies is their primary mission. Planned Parenthood Federation of America released its latest annual report on Tuesday confirming that it once again managed to commit a record number of abortions and increase its taxpayer funding despite laws continuing to shut down abortion businesses in several states. And PPFA's 22-3 annual report reveals that almost two years after the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade and allowed direct abortion bans to be enforced for the first time in half a century, the nation's largest abortion chain still operates almost 600 facilities nationwide, through which it committed 392,715 in the most recent reporting period, abortions that is. And according to the Lozier Institute's uh, Professor Mike, Mike, Michael New. That is a record number of abortions for the organization and represents approximately 40% of the abortions performed in the U.S., as we mentioned a moment ago. At the same time, uh, Planned Parenthood locations made 123,855 telehealth appointments 
accounting for their ability to keep up their pace despite no longer being able to commit abortions in 14 states. Aided by the Biden administration's relaxing regulations, the abortion industry has prioritized male distribution of abortion pills to be taken without medical supervision. The report further boasts that Planned Parenthood assisted more than 15,000 abortion seekers with travel costs and more than 50,000 with cost of the abortions themselves. And again, just think about this. When our tax dollars are being used to pay travel expenses and medical costs for someone who wants to have an abortion in a state where it is legal, uh, can a nation have sunk any lower? And uh, obviously, the implied answer is no. And all of these things, the loss of respect for human life, the love of many growing cold, wars and rumors of wars, Israel being central uh, in the focus of world attention, and most people being against Israel. I just watched a video um, earlier today where there was a, a young girl dressed like she was a member of Hamas and shouting, we are all Hamas, we are all Hamas. And, you know, just the foolishness that's going on in our world that reminds us again that we are living in a time that is as it was in the days of Noah. The thoughts and intents of man's heart is only evil continually. Violence fills the earth. The whole earth is corrupt before God. And the Lord is going to come in judgment as he promised. And he is going to arise and shake the earth as Isaiah chapter 2 prophesies. And before that time, because we do not have an appointment with God's wrath, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says, we are going to be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, as 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, 50 and 51 says. So, you know, we should remain joyful and expectant of that glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I mention that a lot because it keeps our focus where it needs to be. I mean, yes, of course, these things need to be stood against. Uh, we need to uh, fight against abortion and stand with Israel and do all those things and be faithful and fighting the good fight of faith until the end. But we can't lose our joy or be overcome uh, with discouragement by the things going on around us. You know, I've been asked over the years uh, many times, you know, don't you get discouraged reporting on all this negative stuff? Well, it is what the Bible said was coming. And, you know, if we didn't know where this was going, yeah, it would be very discouraging. But, you know, in the last days, perilous times will come. And we are in the last days. And we are in, as I said earlier, I believe the last seconds of the church age in, in comparison to the 2,000 years that there's been a church or thereabouts. So again, don't lose heart. Don't lose hope. Tell people about Jesus. And that's, I think, the most important thing for us to take away from our constant reminders of the lateness of the hour. We're running out of time to rescue those who are drawn towards death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter, as Proverbs 24, 11 and 12 uh, tells us to do. So be encouraged, be bold as lions in these last days, and tell people that there's only one way to be saved. And again, we need to remember we're living around people who are going to go into the tribulation. So don't be afraid to tell them what's coming, because they may not accept what you have told them about the gospel now. But when they see these things coming to pass, they'll think about your words a second time, and they'll hopefully come to saving faith in Christ. Well, that's it for this week. And thank you again for joining us. And please keep Israel in prayer. Uh, you know, I just, uh, my uh, heart goes out to Amir as he's, and many of you who follow him on Telegram have uh, have noticed that he's mentioned several times of late. And we've talked about it in our private conversations. He's got three kids in the military. Three of his four children are in the military and little alone. Uh, his youngest, 10-year-old, obviously is is not old enough to be in the military, but he's scared to death, uh, all the things going on there. So uh, keep him here in family and obviously pray for the peace of Jerusalem and uh, for the hand of God to move in defense of his chosen people. We know that's true, but the Lord has told us to pray anyway. So let's make sure we keep them in prayer. Well, that's it for this week, and uh, we'll see you next week, or we'll see you here, there, or in the air. God bless.